An Austin police officer goes on trial for murder this week, accused of shooting and killing Michael Ramos back in 2020. I'm KVU senior reporter Tony Plahetsky here to get you prepared for the trial of APD officer Christopher Taylor. Taylor was on duty in April 2020 and responded to an apartment complex to a call of people doing drugs and a man with a gun. No gun was ever found. But the call led to this interaction between officers and Michael Ramos in the parking lot. Officers first used a beanbag shotgun to stun Ramos, but he jumped in his car and started driving. And you'll see that here in just a second. You can hear officers giving him those commands. And as he pulls out, that is when Officer Christopher Taylor fired, killing Ramos. Joining me today to break down this case as it heads to the jury are Austin attorneys Jason Ortega and Sandra Riss. I want to thank you both for taking the time to join us today to help us navigate what is ahead probably over the next couple of weeks. Of course, this is the first time in decades, if ever, we've gone back in the history books, that an Austin police officer has ever stood trial on a murder charge. So I just want to talk about legally why that is so significant and how that is so significant in our community. Jason, I'll start with you. Sure, I think that our political climate has changed since uh, 2020, since George Floyd. And although this incident was prior to that incident, the indictment was after that incident. And I think we've seen a lot of changes, not just in Austin, but across the nation regarding police officers and their use of deadly force in um, their job duties. And Sandra, of course, during the social justice protest of 2020, we saw thousands of people in Austin actually carrying signs with Michael Ramos's name on them. A lot of that passion uh, is still existent uh, three years later. It is. Uh, it is definitely still existent in addition to the fact that um, our district attorney, Jose Garza, uh, when he ran for district attorney, ran on a platform of holding officers more accountable for um, for some of these officer involved incidences. And I think that that is another primary reason that we're seeing this happen. Uh, it is monumental, it is historical, it's, um, but it also uh, carries with it the, the political climate that we have going on here. And it's important to note that uh, the grand jury that indicted this case indicted it on a murder charge, so not a, a lesser offense. Of course, murder is the highest level of offense on, on the books. Jason, what does the state have to prove in order to convict uh, Chris Taylor on a murder charge? On a murder charge, the, the state has to prove that he intentionally and knowingly caused the death of another person. But Sandra, as a defense attorney, I know you have a veteran defense attorney here, uh, what will likely be the defense that Christopher Taylor's team uh, brings forward? Well, obviously it's gonna be a self-defense. Um, and more importantly, when talking about the state's uh, burden of proof, um, once the defense raises a self-defense, it's gonna be on the state to disprove beyond a reasonable doubt that that was not self-defense. That is what he's, that is what the state is gonna also have to prove um, that um, is, is basically to disprove um, the defense's argument of self-defense. So the state's gonna have quite a high burden in this particular situation. And when we, you know, break this down a little bit more and get into it a little bit more, of course, we're talking about self-defense, but it is also likely that the defense may also argue that Christopher Taylor shot in defense of other people as well, in defense of other officers. That is part of, of the self-defense statute as well, or self-defense uh, argument as well, right? You are correct. Um, somebody can use lethal force in defense of others if they believe that, it, that the danger is imminent, that it's immediate. Um, and of course, we're talking about Christopher Taylor's belief at that time, not anybody else's. What did Christopher Taylor reasonably believe the decedent was capable of or what was he defending against? But it's complicated too, right? Because there were a number of officers on the scene that day and Christopher Taylor, as far as we know, is the only person who, who 
fired a shot. Does that matter? I'll ask both of you. I think it matters. Absolutely it does. Um, more importantly, I think the defense is going to raise whether or not he was acting under appropriate police protocol. So um, I think the defense is, is probably going to bring out the fact that what he did was in fact, and, and what all of those officers did at the time, and the decision that Christopher Taylor made at that moment was all in line with police protocol. And we were talking earlier that uh, jury selection, which of course will start on Monday, is such a critical part of this whole process. Jury selection may take, as we understand it, uh, a full day on Monday, possibly two days into Tuesday, who knows, even, even longer. But Jason, how critical is getting the jury right for both sides in oh, this case? I think it's absolutely critical and there's, uh, some believe in our industry that cases are won or lost in jury selection. Why, why is that? Uh, because when you're picking a jury, they're going to they're going to be the sole decision maker when it comes to credibility of the witnesses, the weight that they give to each piece of evidence, and ultimately what whether or not the defendant had a reasonable belief to use deadly force. So Sandra, if you are the state, who do you want in the jury box? If you were the defense, who do you want in the jury box? Well, obviously, I mean, the, the, the obvious answer to that is if I'm the state, then I want, um, I want those individuals that feel that officers have the right to use deadly force. Uh, if I'm the defense, I want the jurors that uh, feel that they have uh, crossed that line and that they should not have the ability to use this deadly force uh, so um, as frequently as they have been using uh, deadly force, and we've seen that. Um, I think that it's just important to, to note, as, as Jason pointed out, that cases are won or lost at, at jury selection. I think that the temperament right now in, in the public is very black and white on the use of deadly force and the use of guns, and I think that some people are adamantly um, in support of the use of guns and deadly force when it's necessary and there are others that just don't feel that way. So weeding through those strong-minded jurors and finding the jurors that will be um, able to follow the law uh, is going to be crucial to both sides of, of the team here. And Jason, we were talking earlier too, you know, going back over, over the decades that I've covered law enforcement, some of whom have gone to trial for uses of force, not lethal force here in our community, but the standard, or at least the mindset has always been, and what experts have frequently said is, it's really, really difficult to convict a police officer, that there is a deference that is frequently given by jurors to police officers but it sounds like you agree that that, that standard or, or that deference has truly shifted in recent years. I do, that, I do believe for the layperson that it's completely shifted. And I think um, in the past, it was always, you know, with police officers, we don't necessarily know what they're thinking going into a high crisis situation. So it becomes very difficult to understand what, what a person reasonably believed at that time. However, as Ms. Ritz mentioned the political climate or one of the most polarized issues is the fact whether we should be carrying guns at all. And we've seen this be put to a test in this community just in recent weeks. Jason, I'll ask both of you, but I'll start with you. We're several weeks now past the Daniel, Daniel Perry verdict, which was a huge uh, case in our community, obviously received national attention. Does what happened in that case portend anything possibly about this case? You know, it's difficult to say because that wasn't necessarily an officer involved shooting. Um, and so I think that it, I think it's, it's all relevant. Um, I think it's something that's gonna be certainly fresh on the jury's mind if they're watching the news. Um, but I don't think that they're necessarily uh, similar in fact, in fact, 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 fact pattern. Um, I, I do believe that the police 
while on duty is a little bit different and is going to require a different mindset when the jury looks at this versus Daniel Perry's case. A couple of more questions. Let's say for the sake of discussion that you are on Officer Taylor's defense team. Do you put him on the stand mm -hmm. and what is that calculation? Yeah, that's always a, the toughest decision for the defense team to make and, and often a decision that is made at the closing of the state's case. Um, in a prior murder trial that I tried with Joe Turner, uh, we had every intention of putting our client on the stand uh, in a self-defense case and at the closing of the state's evidence, we made a strategic decision not to have our client testify. Um, in that particular situation, uh, it, it was favorable to the defense and it was a not guilty verdict. But generally speaking, a jury wants to hear from uh, the defendant in a self-defense case. That is generally the rule. That's a decision that the defense team will have to make at the closing of the state's case. What do you think about that possibility? Uh, I think that it's definitely a possibility. That's one of those decisions that's ultimately left up to the defendant. Um, to make for themselves. Of course, that comes with some admonishments from the judge, you know, informing the defendant that he's got rights and he does not have to testify, nor is the jury supposed to consider whether or not the, the defendant testifies. Um, in a most, the most recent murder case that I had, we did put our uh, defendant on the stand and he did testify. And interviewing the jury after they closed, um, they found, we found, that jury members wanted to hear from the defendant and they found him to be the most credible witness in our trial that we had in February, which resulted in a hung jury. A couple of more questions I want to uh, just ask both of you. Of course, not only is this case significant because it is a murder case against a police officer, this is also a unique case in that Christopher Taylor actually faces two murder charges, one in, in this case in the death of Michael Ramos, but one a year earlier in, in the shooting death of a man uh, in downtown Austin whose family says mm. he was suffering from, from a mental break. Does that case have any bearing on what is going to be happening in the courtroom in this case? It's possible that that information comes in for limited purposes, and I think it's gonna depend on whether or not Mr. Taylor testifies. Sandra, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, I, if he testifies, there's, there's that possibility that that door is going to open, but more than likely, that information is not going to be presented um, as evidence to the jury. Um, so I think that, unfortunately, in the community, people watch news. <laughs> and so I think every single person on the jury probably knows that. Um, again, this is where you look for the juror that is going to follow the law and not consider any evidence that is not admiss admissible in trial. So just as a point of education too for, for myself and others, so yes, Christopher Taylor is charged with murder. It is possible that he, if the jury wants to convict, that he could be convicted on some other charge less than murder. Can, can you both explain how that works? It's often called lesser included offenses, Jason. Um, right now, I don't know that they're including any lesser included offenses. However, because it is the state's case, it's their burden, they've got to prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Oftentimes, if they feel like they're not going to meet that burden, they will include lesser included. So it's kind of you know, it gives the jury an out, so to speak. If you don't find that we met these elements, perhaps we met these elements of this lesser included. Sandra, could you see that happening in this case? I can see that happening, but I can also see the exact opposite happening. I can see... Uh, all or nothing. All or nothing. I think that the DA has made a decision to indict this case as a murder, and I think that uh, for all intents and purposes, that is what he wants to see if the jury's gonna come back with a murder conviction or not. I'm not asking you to predict either one of you, but closing thoughts on, on this case as we go into it next week. I think the state has a very high burden to prove. And, um, and I, 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 as a defense lawyer, I have a lot of respect for the defense team. Um, I do as well for the state. Uh, the special prosecutor, Gary Cobb, that was brought in. Um, I think that uh, both sides are gonna have uh, an incredible case to present 
and um, I'm just I'm just not going to crystal ball that right now, but I will be watching very closely. Yeah, Jason, they don't call it a trial for they call it a trial for a reason. Exactly, and and what some would say is this: these are the facts that trials are made of, and hats off to both the de defense team and the prosecution. Great attorneys on both sides. Difficult case coming up for both of them, and I can't wait to see how it turns out. Jason Ortega, Sandra Ritz, thank you so much for your knowledge and expertise. Thank you, Tony. We appreciate thank you. your time. Jury selection does start on Monday. We anticipate opening statements and testimony to start on Wednesday. All throughout this trial, we're going to have daily recaps and analysis just like this to keep you up to speed on this case. Tune in every night at 7 p.m. on KVU+. Plus. You can download that for free on your Roku or Fire TV device. And if you miss the live event at 7, you can go back and watch anytime on KVU+. Plus.